All right, so today we are starting, or we are finishing um, another subject, which will be the transfer learning and other advanced applications. This is going to be kind of a quite a dense um, lecture, but the notebook I'm giving you is quite simple, so hopefully you won't have to spend too much time later on. Okay, so we... Let's start. So we are more done with the course. Tomorrow we'll have, uh, let's say, simpler day talking about explainable AI. I think it's a good subject to finish because at the end of the day, this is what we want to do. Once we manage to uh, make our network or whatever other machine technique uh, to learn, we would like to understand what happened. We would like to understand what parameters are important. We would like to go and dig for the, what's going on behind this complex data set. But today, I'm going, we are going to just go through some uh, important concept, which is called transfer learning, as well as some very new applications that are happening. Now, first transfer learning, I don't know, you Google, uh, uh, pictures of babies. There are lots of very cute pictures <laughs> like this one. But essentially, you think how we have been teaching our much to learn. Every time, it was like a newborn baby in the sense that uh, you gave the neural network, let's say, a new data set or an environment, and it had to learn from this environment using our guidance, uh, meaning testing against known labels, uh, using our techniques of clustering, or even using rewards and iterating this process many times. But it was a starting scratch. Now, when you do that, especially in complex data sets, you will have to build architectures that are deep, uh, to do deep learning, to go from this complexity that you have at the beginning to simpler features later on, and actually understand relations between inputs and outputs. This takes a long time to run, to optimize, and so on. And whatever at the end of the day is expressing relations that are in this particular data set. So they are very specific to the data set and to the task you have given the machine. When you think about how we learn, not only babies, but you know, everyone, we don't learn every task that we do from scratch. A good example is when um, humans start learning language, the concept of language. They learn uh, maybe in a particular language or in several, depending on what their environment is. And they learn that there are generic concepts, like for example, when they want to label an action, like run or eat, they learn that those are a type of uh, word you want that corresponds to what we would call ver verbs. Or when they want to point the finger to an object or a person, those will be names. Or when they talk about the characteristics of objects, um, like being blue or soft or so, they understand that there is this somehow concept of adjective. So when they learn in one language, they don't have to relearn from scratch all these concepts that are common to all languages when they have, for example, to go from English to Spanish, Chinese, or whatever is the other languages they are learning. So they are already doing a transfer in the learning they used in one particular setup, which let's say is English, to another setup that has and shares some commonalities, okay? So our machines should do this too. So um, are you there? Yes, you are there, right? Okay. So let's see how we do transfer learning, how we teach our machines to not redo every task from scratch. And one way of thinking about this is to focus on um, image classification and supervised learning. We've done some CNNs. We are already quite used to, especially the means data set. 
and how to use convolutional neural networks to do classification. So if you remember in the CNNs, you had a data set of images. In your case, it was digits, handwritten digits. And then you build a neural network architecture that typically contains several convolutional layers that can deal at the, with the input with our images then do transformations on these images, like convolution, some redo, pulling, and so on. And then, at the very end of all this uh, process of transforming the images to new images uh, that contain different features, you pass to a, full, a dense or a fully connected neural network, which then helps you in doing the final classification. The outputs of the last neural network had to be precisely the probabilities of your classification. In, remember that in your case, the outputs of the neural network was a soft mass max final layer that contained 10 possibilities. And you will read the outputs as the probability of being one of these digits with the highest probability assigned to the most likely outcome of this classification. So essentially what you do, is you start with images that uh, remember maybe the, the case of the cats and dogs can be quite complicated and you want to isolate the important parts of these uh, images. What you do is to slide over the image and then transform it using and preserving translation and, uh, and uh, relative distances. And then you, the different hidden layers, what they are going to do is in the case of the convolutional is to change images into other images which uh, maybe deal first with the simple shapes. Let's say here there is a big shape, there there is some noise and so on, to more complex shapes. And in the case of this flower, probably at the very end there will be something that is, uh, is there will be shapes that are very specific to flowers. It has trimmed down all this information into the fact that in images there are big shapes, then more complex features, and then isolating those features that are typical from flowers. In this case, for example, is the fact that there is a, this big blob and then there are petals over here. So at the end of this convolutional uh, part of my network, I'm going to probably have some kind of uh, images, quote unquote, that will not look like the initial image at all, but it will contain the features that are typical from a flower. And then the outputs of this, you will let them transform them into arrays instead of images, like we did in the, in the notebook for CNNs. And these will be fed into a neural network that then will finally get a classifier, which then can be interpreted as probability. For example, in this, in here, the idea is that you have lots of images and you want to classify flowers, cups, cars, and trees, which again for a human are quite simple, but uh, you, that's what you want to do. Okay. So the hidden layers are transforming the initial image into something more abstract, from simple and complex shapes to shapes that are specific to a flower or a car or a cap or a tree. And at the end, all this is transformed into vectors that are fed into uh, another set of neural networks, in this case, neural fully connected. What you can see here is that uh, the initial layers, the just inputting the images of cars, flowers, and so on, all what they are doing is um, tasks that uh, are probably common to most problems of image classification. So the idea is that you can probably reuse some of these initial steps in any problem of image classification. And that in this case is transfer learning. So we can change the target of our study. We can change the data set and the output structure. Let's say that now you want to classify cats and dogs and your output is going to be cats and dogs, you can change what you fit into the neural network 
as you can also change the final part where you actually give a classification, cats or dogs, but still keep what you are doing over here, which is essentially, let it be a flower picture, or a cat picture, or a dog picture, or what you do is to try to trim down and redundant or useless parts of your image. So transfer learning allows me to keep some of the architecture and initial computations, meaning that I can keep some of the weights that were already optimized for this task of image classification and just rerun the part that then specializes on my particular problem. This is useful because of course increases the speed and reusability of whatever you do, but mostly because um, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but uh, we humans might not be as good as machines in some specific tasks. For example, we might not be as fast or reliable, or we might not be as, uh, um, how to say, able to handle lots of data or, uh, or sparse data. But we are really good at many tasks at the same time. We are pretty good, let's say. We are multipurpose. We can talk, we can move, we can uh, view, and uh, now you probably appreciate the, the difficulty that uh, human vision has and how difficult it was to implement in computers. And many other things, high level tasks that we can do, maybe not perfect, maybe not as good as a machine built on purpose for this uh, particular task, but we are pretty good. And uh, the idea is that uh, we would like also our AI uh, to become also multipurpose. And we cannot do this if every time we set a new task, we have to rerun everything and you know uh, start from scratch. We really need to allow some uh, uh, transfer learning to happen so that the machine can learn new tasks without having to actually retrain completely. So that's a very common uh, technique used especially in computer vision and in, uh, in natural language processing. It's repurposing pre-trained networks that are already there and that we can reuse. And the idea is the following. For example, in this image classification task, we have a input that goes to a set of convolutional layers. So it transforms images and then the final part is a set of fully connected neural networks that lead to an output, the prediction. In our case, it was a softmax or some other type of classification uh, prediction. And what we were saying that probably the beginning of all this convolutional task uh, doesn't have to specialize on our particular input so that we can take a, an already trained neural network take the weights that uh, corresponds to the first part and just keep them. Remember that when we train a neural network, what we are doing is to put input, then we vary weights and so on. We see the prediction, we compute the loss with the, with the true labels, and then we run again, and we make sure that this time we do a bit better and we keep running and running. So we learn to adjust the weights at each step so that our description of the data is as, as closely to reality as possible. So when what you can do is instead of readjust weights every time you run, you can decide to freeze some of the weights in parts of the neural network. In particular, you could, for example, freeze the beginning of your neural network, for example, when the network is actually just removing uh, spurious things in your images, and doing max pooling, reducing noise, identifying big objects, because those tasks are not so specific of the particular problem. You could also just freeze the whole convolutional network and the set of the neural network and just use those weights straight ahead and use them for a new problem. Okay, and then you, this is already frozen, so every time you run, you don't have to actually vary this. It's kept frozen at these values, there's preset values, and you just uh, focus on specializing on this last part of your network. Now, all this 
machine learning net frameworks, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and so on, will contain these pre-trained models, many of those actually. So for images, you can call for already existing networks with their weights and their architecture already set, uh, like for example, VGG, ResNet, DenseNet, Inception, and Exception are typical examples. And for tasks like uh, nat natural language processing, so understanding human language, written speech, and so on, or sound speech, you can already use a, a set of uh, different um, pre-trained models, like word to vec is a very common one. Okay, so where is the idea? Is that, for example, in your analysis, you can call for a model. VGG16 is one example. And this model is made of a, lot, a very long architecture with 16 layers. Many of them are convolutional. Then you have a fully connected at the end. So you see, this is a typical architecture you will use for image processing. And you can decide that uh, this has been maybe train on lots of images of objects, uh, and you want to train it on a particle physics problem where you have images of jets. Okay, so you, what you might decide to do is to call the model, so the architecture is set. You might decide to call it and then leave frozen the beginning of the model, where essentially you are looking at the images of your jets and removing the parts that are empty. You are clustering some uh, interesting features in your images and so on. And then continue then running and specializing to your jet images in this part and then do the classification at the end with the neural network, with a fully connected neural network. Or you might decide to speed up even more and just freeze the whole uh, initial convolutional part of your neural network, run your jet images as if they were cats, dogs, flowers, and cars, and whatever, and just specialize in the part of the neural network or the fully connected neural network on the classification itself. And those things will work very, very well. And this is what I'm going to give you in this uh, um, notebook today, okay? So this strategy will reduce a lot of the computing time. It will help on generalizing tasks, meaning that uh, even when you are doing a particle physics problem and you are trying to get the best you can at your data set, let's go back to these jet images. Um, there is always this issue with neural networks that are so expressive that you might run a super long, deep uh, neural network get super good at actually uh, predicting what is happening in your data set. And then you look at another data set and it doesn't generalize well. It does not predict that well. For example, it could be that you are running an analysis of Monte Carlo simulations of jets and you do great. And then you go and see on real events, even though your Monte Carlo has fast sim and you are doing the best you can as an experimentalist, then you look at the real data and it's not looking that great. It's not generalizing well. Why? Because you you train, over train your network. So one way, another way of uh, checking robustness of your procedure is actually doing transfer learning. If I'm so good at identifying types of general physics, well, I should be able to use a pre-purpose Oh, sorry, pre-trained uh, multi-purpose uh, neural network like VGG or whatever, and then do my classification. And this one might be more robust and more generalizable than me, my super specialized network that I trained from the very beginning. Now, to make sure precisely that this uh, repurposing is, um, is robust, I'll, uh, usually when you do transfer learning, you will also do data augmentation, okay? So that's another typical thing to do. So I've given you an example uh, in the notebook, well, a couple of examples of trans transfer learning. One is to use, the again, the means data set, and instead of training a full CNN from the beginning, 
just upload uh, some pre-trained model and run much faster and check your accuracy. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to show you that this uh, transfer learning is in practice not difficult to use. It's very implemented in most uh, uh, frameworks. The only thing you need to do is to adapt the input shape to whatever is your, are your inputs and also the output layer because you might have another classification problem or so. The, the notebook today contains these examples and it's just a template to start exploring. It's not a, like a fully uh, shaped uh, notebook where I go from A to C. It's just to show you another framework to, to do things. Now, the rest of the lecture, what I'm going to do is to uh, show you some cool examples of non-standard use of machine learning. I didn't want to finish the course without giving you at least a, a flavor of what's going on. And what I've done is to cherry pick, and very much cherry pick, some applications of AI to physics and math. And uh, due to time constraints, I'm not going to give you many, just four, but uh, these are just examples of the uh, cool things one can do using machine learning, okay? Now, by now, you probably <clears throat> are aware and realize that uh, the specificity of neural networks, the ability it has of uh, dealing with complex data sets and finding a highly non-trivial relations uh, in these data sets are going to be useful for any numerical uh, problems you have. It, uh, indeed, it, machine learning is um, very helpful when you have to sample in parameter space and in speed up in numerical computations. The specificity of neural networks, they run super fast. I don't know if you realize like it's uh, maybe hundreds of thousands of parameters of a neural network and each iteration is extremely fast. So you can quickly explore relations among inputs and outputs that uh, will help you in speeding up numerical problems. Yesterday, we, we discussed already how in the context of reinforcement learning, um, these kind of techniques have been used to, uh, to speed up and improve on, on simulations that are usually numerically very costly, like uh, fluid dynamics. Um, and here I just wanted to show you another, like really just a, a showing uh, the, out there, another particularly impressive, impressive example that appeared very recently. All the examples I'm going to give to you is, they are like from the last four or six months. Okay, so they are very uh, new. But uh, this is a paper that is called uh, up to two billion times acceleration in scientific simulations with uh, deep learning, essentially. And the idea is that they build a deep learning architecture and they use this architecture to the same architecture with the same hyperparameters, with the same algorithm, same everything. And they use it to accelerate simulations in very different uh, situations, astrophysics, climate science, biogemistry, high energy density physics, function, fusion energy, for example, for Thomas Gap, or ITER simulations, seismology, like earthquakes. And these are just a couple of examples. This is aerosol circulation, so how in the atmosphere, as a function of longitude and latitude, uh, and as a function of time, because these are pictures that change with time, what kind of simulations are done, and this is the state of the art, and how our neural network is able to speed up this simulation by a huge amount. And this is the emulator over here, leading to very similar predictions. There are many more, like all these different examples. They also apply to galaxy halos. And they are of the, but the way they represent the comparison between the state-of-the-art simulator and the emulator, which is based on this neural network, is to the power spectrum and the angular distribution. And what you see is like you can't see the difference. It's a logarithmic scale, but essentially it speeds up incredibly 
all these uh, very complex numerical simulations. So if in your research you are stuck with, uh, or, or you are not able to explore the parameter space you would like to be able to explore because you have to spend a lot of time doing simulations, probably it's worth looking at these kind of techniques. Here there are the clicks, uh, you know, you can click on this um, example. Now, numerical acceleration is great. I'm not a numerical person in the sense I don't do simulations. I, I think only very patient people can do that. Um, so uh, there are also other kinds of uh, techniques that can be used from uh, artificial intelligence that might solve or help us solve highly, what I would call highly non-trivial set of problems. And those are what I would say the inverse problems. Typical problem, right? You, that we all physicists uh, have to deal with. You have data and you need to find why the data behaves the way it behaves. And usually what we do is that we have uh, some theory behind, theory guidance that tells us that there are some possible laws that could describe this day behavior. And usually we don't go just uh, from uh, the data directly into the laws. We, we have some kind of uh, intuition or pre-build uh, examples that allow us to actually build these laws, to understand this behavior. A fit to the data is just a simple example of trying to do this, what is called an inverse problem. There are many types of inverse problem in physics, medicine, and so on. And here there is, I put you a, a link to a very good uh, review on that, and also this one. But in general, the idea is that uh, if I show you, for example, many images of a fluid, or let's say you sit down and start looking at fluids for a long time and taking pictures of it, and uh, record the behavior of the fluid in different situations and how it evolves with time and so on, will you be able to learn that most of the behavior of the fluid is produced or is a manifestation of uh, an equation, a differential equation, which we call the Navier-Stokes? Okay, uh, you probably realize that this is such a complicated nonlinear set of phenomena that by just looking at it or examining it from scratch, it will be very difficult to end up discovering that there is a partial differential equation that describes this. And the way we do is not that way, right? We don't look at data and then obtain these partial differential equations. We actually start from basic principles that then lead to generalizing and so on, and then we find an equation that describes the behavior of the data. And this is a, the case for, for mo most of the things we do, not only Navier-Stokes, but the Maxwell equation, Schrodinger equation, all these equations that came from observing nature, but also introducing some of our physics, mathematical way of dealing with things, um, allows us to actually find these laws of nature. They are p partial differential equations. These laws are always like this, right? And we, we know them. We know uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, after a lot of work from many people, we know that the Schrodinger equation is a good description of uh, the behavior of our wave function, that the eigenvalues are precisely the energy levels, and so on and so forth. Maxwell and uh, contemporaries took a long time until they actually found these particular differential equations. And so it's weird stokes for so many other things we want to do. But um, whether you work in physics or in another, uh, particle physics or in another area, you know that what precisely what we want to do is not just uh, check uh, the equations that already exist, but we would like to find new equations. We would like to find, for example, in particle physics, we would like to find new physics, which will have their own uh, conservation laws and their own uh, physics laws of behavior. And they will probably come in terms of partial differential equations. 
And there are the other areas in physics where the exact equations or even approximate equations are not known, or not known. For example, imagining climate physics, right? Climate change or the behavior of climate and so on. In complex situations, those laws are not known. Okay? So in order to model climate, we need to introduce a lot of assumptions uh, and uh, then solve differential equations that have a lot of fudge factors because we actually don't know what's the real physics behind and whether there is any simple description of this complex behavior. So to advance uh, in this direction, we can keep uh, doing what we do, which is uh, learn by the previous examples or use uh, symmetries or use, which is at the end of the day, in particle physics, the only thing we know how to do well. Or we can try some different approach, which is to pose an inverse problem. For example, in the case of fluid dynamics, you could say, well, given a temporary evolution of my fluid and having collected lots of possibilities and lots of situations, could I deduce what is the equation that governs this fluid? So how the temporary evolution of the fluid or whatever parameter you want to explain has to do with the position and possible temp uh, space derivatives. So what is the response of the medium to, uh, and, uh, to the time evolution? For example, you could say uh, in two dimensions, just to fix ideas, you could say that you want to solve this kind of problem. You know, to, you want to find this response function f uh, by looking at the data. And in particular, that means finding whether or not there is a first derivative respect to x in your equation, or a second derivative, or there are mixed derivatives over here. So it's finding whether those terms do exist. So what these uh, people over here in this paper did and then improved uh, later on was precisely doing that setting up a type of neural network where this problem could be posed and look at the temporary evolution of this problem to actually deduce what are these coefficients and deduce whether the equation uh, that we are looking at is contains first or second derivatives, mixed terms, and so on. Uh, what you sh shown here is from the first paper where they show the true coefficients of all these terms, whereas is the predicted. Uh, the true coefficients could be quite complicated. They could have a x, y dependence and so on. So it says like a, this can be quite complicated. And they shown, for example, that if they show simulations, lots of simulations of a Navier stock fluid, they can actually recover the Navier stock equation. The good thing about this paper is that the code is here, so you can actually run it and it adapt it for your own situation if you want to do so. And um, there are, this area is quite uh, active, I would say, there are many people looking at not just PDS, PDEs, but also normal uh, differential equations. Um, and it's an area, for example, looking at neural differential equations, and I put here a link. Okay, so another example, this is an example where you can actually pose in some way the inverse problem. Given a data set, can I deduce what form my equation will take? Another example that I found funny, and it's uh, from, uh, from like say a month ago, not even, is something that the authors call AI Feynman. It's made by Max Bergmark and another, I guess it's a postdoc in Princeton. Um, what they did is the following. They did uh, something similar to the example before, but they tried to use tricks that are typical from physicists. So instead of simply show data and try to find equations that could fit this data. What they did is to, or using a brute force neural network and some architecture that has been optimized, they actually did a, a set of uh, steps that are guided by some intuition, physical intuition. 
the, for example, they first examine whether the data will be a good polynomial fit, and then they just did that. Or if not, or they use dimensional analysis, that always helps in reducing the type of uh, terms that you could have. And if none of these things uh, were, were a good fit or they help, then you go for a brute force analysis where you train a neural network. They also use the fact that maybe in the neural network they identify that they could be symmetries in your problem and they use those to reduce the problem and actually you train again with a reduced uh, set of variables or they use essentially typical tricks that a physicist will do. So in that sense, I think it's very nice. They also pose the problem as a game, if you want, for anybody that wants to use it. It's like mysteries. They took the Feynman uh, lectures, you, you know, these books, with hundreds of equations. They created the cassettes for all of those. And then uh, they set a, a mystery quest where you can try to obtain these physics equations in the Feynman lectures. They then uh, compare with a commercial tool that is trying to do something similar. While there is a commercial tool trying to find expressions, like as, uh, compact expressions for inputs, mostly because of finance. So people in finance would like to understand whether there are equations of this time that they could use to speed up their simulations of future prediction for, for example, stock markets and so on. So there are there is a commercial tool that's probably very expensive that is used for that purpose. So these people took uh, and compared what they were doing with this neural network, this AI Feynman, with this commercial tool. And the commercial tool, of course, it took for much longer, needed more data set, a longer data set as well. And they it didn't get right a uh, hundred percent of the of the of the equations, in fact, only got right about 50% or 60%, whereas this tool was doing great. Okay, but it, of course, uh, it has tricks and tricks that are typical from physicists. The nice thing is that the article is there, of course, and the code and data sets are all av also available. So if, again, for your particular physics problem, you think something like this could help you find non-trivial relations like these ones among your inputs, this is a good tool to check out. They do not handle yet PDA, PDs. We are talking about a tool that appeared like three weeks ago, but as they say in their paper, they are trying to handle this. So essentially, if they they introduce PDA, PDs, sorry to go back, we will be doing, this tool will be able to do what these other guys are doing, PDNA, but with the tricks typical from physicists, which is to find uh, redundancies to symmetries, polynomials, and so on. Okay. Another example is uh, uh, the idea that uh, if you look at neural networks and the way they are actually handling the data, maybe the neural networks, as they take your data and they start manipulating it, some of the line in the hidden layers may be there is where the neural network has discovered that there is a symmetry, a hidden symmetry you as a, as a physicist hadn't discovered yet. So what is a symmetry? I mean, I don't need to explain this, but the idea is that uh, if I do a transformation of my inputs and the output is the same, it could be by chance, right? Or it could be because there is actually a symmetry. And it could, uh, would, the, the idea of these people in this paper is to run a neural network, look at the content of the one of the last hidden layers where lots of transformations have already been done. And by doing the tricks we learn in unsupervised learning, so doing PCA and clustering, they might be able to then identify specific uh, types of structures of symmetries. PCA, for example, will tell you that uh, from all this data and the representation that it acquires in one of the last layers, there are actually few dim dimensions that can uh, describe this data. And it, it is reduction, dimensional reduction, might be because there is actually a symmetry at play. 
And the class series and analysis will allow you to then try to identify what kind of uh, symmetries at play. So in this paper, they use this TSNE analysis, which, which now you guys you know how to do, and to realize that, for example, uh, the number of clusters that uh, the data shows in one of the last layers, or the distribution of the, the number of PCA components that are relevant, or the distribution in these last layers is actually indication of SO2, SU2, or Z2, or, or, or all kinds of discrete and continuous symmetries. This is a very recent paper. Um, it's very, very rough. I'm not saying that this is the last word, not at all. It's actually something that is starting right now. And uh, I, I find it very interesting. But just to tell you, give you a kind of feeling that, you know, there is much more than just handling big data, big time and complex stuff we don't actually understand very well. You can use the power of expression of your neural network. The ability has of transforming raw inputs into more abstract things to actually see whether the neural network has discovered something fundamental about the data. Okay. And yes, uh, that, that uh, can be put even farther by, for example, uh, going from not data, we are not talking about numbers, actually treating symbolic expressions as inputs for a neural network. And this is what is done in this paper. And again, nice thing is, the, is that the code is available, so you can again play with it. What these people do in symbolic mathematics in this paper, they show that uh, you can take, for example, all kinds of uh, symbolic expressions like um, numerical, like two plus three multiplied by, and they have rules on how to express it as a tree of decisions or, or steps. This is, by the way, similar to what these people have done. They have used also these kind of techniques. Or things that are even more complicated, for example, polynomial expressions, partial derivatives, and so on. And they feed all this into a neural network where they feed the stuff given an input, where is the numerical output, or given a symbolic input, where is the integral of this expression, or given an input like this, which is a differential equation, where is the analytical expression of the solution. So they create data sets that are completely numerical, where the entries of the data sets are essentially instructions on how you go, right? Whether you sum, there is a power, there is a cosinus, there is a derivative, there is an index here, there is an index here, and stuff like this. The setup is maybe not super intuitive at the beginning, but once you follow those rules and they found that uh, there was a particular set of, or a particular way of expressing analytical expressions. Then they ran a neural network that is based, by the way, is a neural network that has been specialized for natural language processing. So it's a set of techniques that have been used by people because this is people in, in uh, Facebook, essentially to try to understand the context and the meaning and the sentiment that you want of what users in Facebook are uh, do, have when they write something. So they use these NLP algorithms to learn to symbolically solve integrals, differential equations, etc. So for example, for this is one of the tables they show is that given these examples of integrants, what is the integral? analytically, and they, obset, uh, they obtain these things using their neural network. They speed up a lot. They can benchmark against mathematical lab, and other commercial tools. They realize they're actually obtaining higher precision. And also even for some expressions, uh, let's say of integrals that, or uh, differential equations that uh, mathematical MATLAB doesn't give an answer, this me method is able to give an answer. It's able to learn to do integrals and to solve differential equations 
even though it has not seen these particular ones before, to the point where it's able to actually generalize and obtain new integrals and new differential equation solutions that uh, are not contained in these conversion tools, which is, I think, pretty awesome. And, and again, it's a very recent paper. The code is also available and pretty easy to use, I must say. So again, I think it's worth checking if you want to explore further. Okay, this has been a few examples of cherry picking uh, uh, on my part of uh, things that I thought they were cool, but there are many other cool things out there when it comes to physics and mathematics and the use of machine learning. So it's just a, a matter of whether you want to explore or adapt some of these techniques to your particular research. What we are going to do today or for the rest of the day is the following. In this notebook, uh, that I link here, you have some brief, brief examples of uh, transfer learning for MINST, which you are going to load uh, a pre-trained uh, image classification uh, algorithm with their weights and so on. And this algorithm has been trained on, of, on images of cars and people and faces of people and so on. And uh, you are going to use a framework, which is PyTorch. Why I want to then change from TensorFlow to PyTorch? Because I want you guys to be able to see an example where you're calling transfer learning from PyTorch in a very similar way that you would do for TensorFlow. When you look at the code of um, other people, for example, this one here or others, uh, you are going to see that they, they use either TensorFlow or PyTorch. And when it comes to more, let's say, uh, development of algorithms, like the fast uh, the AI Feynman, PDNs, this uh, example I just showed you of symbolic mathematics, these people tend to use PyTorch and not TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow is used mostly, you know, for common purpose, uh, super fast, is, you know, Google uh, wins it all and so on. But when it comes to developing, I like, see, uh, theoretical, let's say, applications, PyTorch seems to be more common. And I don't want you to be, like, to be blocked by the fact that we have been using only TensorFlow. I'll give you an example. Do you see how the syntax is very simple? Maybe the documentation is not great, but you can get the meaning of what's going on over there. And uh, when it comes to particle physics, also there is this tool in PyTorch called FastAI. The syntax is again very compact. There are lots of things that for particle physics are already implemented. And I thought it would be good to give you an example where at least you see how it works. Um, also, I didn't want to you to so learn transfer learning just based on uh, means because you must be fed up with this means a benchmark like whenever you develop a new algorithm or you're checking something you probably want to uh, gauge it against means that's why it's already there you can just call it it's everywhere it's in keras it's in pytorch it's everywhere so it's good that you you get used to dealing with images with means and what the problem is but uh, in practice, you are not going to be working on means, that you are working on particle physics. So what I did is to give you an example of uh, something I did with collaborators. So I don't know if you're aware, but in the LAC commu community, they, since, since I was young, so a million years ago, we have been doing Olympics. And before the LAC started, the idea of the Olympics was to give a um, uh, to theories and experimentalists, black boxes containing events that will or simulated events that will correspond to specific theories with a huge standard model background. And the idea was to make physicists compete with each other in these Olympics, quote unquote, and uh, see who will develop the best strategy to find an unknown new physics a model that has that appear in this data. So in January we had a new one. I participated mostly because I'm working with younger people and the, this is a good uh, learning curve. So uh, one of the things we did was to precisely change uh, 
the challenge that was given to us as events with characteristics and so on, we changed it to images. And based on these images of so jets and so on, we actually found the new physics uh, that was behind. Okay, so today I just give you an example. It's not fully fledged, but uh, I give you the images of, the, of some of the jets. I give you the comments that you will need to do a classification of standard model versus new physics. And hopefully that's something that you can adapt for your own problem. Okay. Because it was a small data set, we used augmentation and it really helps a lot. So just to tell you. So uh, it, uh, after you go through this notebook, today you might have a little bit more time. If you are already used to, they say, deal with PyTorch or so, or you, you understand what's going on with the jet physics. Uh, so I would recommend that you check out some of these newest applications. I think this Feynman AI is really funny uh, because it's set as a fun quest. And I like the idea of uh, not just using neural networks, new brute force, but actually using the intuitions that we have in terms of dimensional analysis, symmetries, and so on. So I will check out this first. Or if you like music, uh, here I put you some example of using transfer learning to identify the style of uh, a music snippet. Okay, just for something for fun. And what we will do tomorrow is uh, to spend the lecture talking about explainable AI. Because again, for me, this is an area that hasn't been developed yet, but it's coming. And it's naturally the thing that you guys want to do in physics. You want to use the power of AI, but you also want to understand what the, what the heck is uh, going on with this neural network, what it's actually doing. Okay. Any questions? And you are still there, right? Uh, I have a question uh, more related with uh, transfer learning. Yeah. Uh, the concept of fine tuning, uh, could you explain it? Or I don't know yeah. if it is related. It is, it is related. Uh, let me see. Let's go back here. Here. Yeah. Can you see my, my slide? Yes. Right. So the idea is the following. When you run a neural network, like when you did CNNs for the mean state, what you do is introduce the input and all these epochs that you are running with the batch size so that you are putting first a, a batch of data then another, then you run the full data set, then you run again, you run again. What you're doing in each iteration is you start with a set of uh, uh, parameters, initial parameters, and then you start modifying them Essentially, you are trying to find the best description of the da your data. And what it means is that you are changing your weights at each iteration to describe more closely the data, okay? So that your outputs become more closer to the true outputs that we know. That's what you do in supervised learning, right? So this uh, running through the neural network, improving your accuracy, Essentially, what you're doing is fine tuning your weights so that they describe the data and you better and you increase your accuracy. So when we do transfer learning, uh, usually we remove some of this tuning or fine tuning if you want, or the weights. We actually freeze the weights of the initial layers to whatever was their default value when they train on another data set. And the only part that we actually fine tune, that we are running and changing as we run through the network in each epoch, is actually a smaller of your weights. Okay? Is this clear? Okay. Yes. Any Thank more questions? Ah, definitely. Any more questions? Hi, Veronica. Yeah. Can I have you? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, any. Uh, specific uh, choice of neural network which you would uh, move forward with if you are uh, working on the problems of particle reconstruction in uh, particle physics? Yes, yeah, so in this case, if you are able to um, express your information, your inputs as images, 
This could be positions in your detector uh, with, uh, for example, uh, colors or shapes that corresponds to the energy depositions. Or it could be a, a set of events and their probability distribution in some two-dimensional or three-dimensional space of your variables. If you can do that, if you can change your whatever is your information that could be just a CSV or, or whatever into some form of image where the image might, might be just a probability distribution or it can be an actual space distribution where the information of energy depositions and ID of particles is encoded by shapes of colors or so. If you can do that, I will then use uh, this image uh, recognition type of um, of, uh, of pre-trained models. And this is actually what I do in the notebook. I show you how you change, um, you have images of jets that have been created precisely in that way. Is in each event is the distribution of uh, energy depositions with uh, some density given by the amount of energy. And then we, I pass this through an already trained, I think it's a ResNet. Uh, there's like a no, I cannot give you like a clear uh, indication of for your problem when you do transfer learning, do BGG, ResNet, or DenseNet. Depends on your problem. I know for specific problems, the things that work better. Uh, but yeah, um, it, it's a trial and error. The, the nice thing about this transfer learning is that it speeds up the whole process of training a network, meaning that you can spend more time actually exploring different forms of transferring, whether DenseNet is better for you or ResNet is better for you. A rule of thumb I will give you is if your images or your information is sparse, um, try not to use a too much or too complicated uh, network. For example, VGG. Uh, there, are, there are VGG with, uh, let me go back here, with 16 layers, with 19 layers. There is ResNet with uh, 120 layers, DenseNet, Inception, except there are many options, and some of them are extremely complicated. So your inputs are not too complicated and you start using a very dense or very long and um, deep neural network and then you start retraining a lot of it, uh, you are going to end up overfitting, surely. So sometimes what I will say is if you want to use transfer learning, start with a simple uh, transfer, with a simple model where you freeze most of it and then you start unfreezing and see whether you gain anything. And uh, when you saturate with that, you go to a com more complex and deeper neural network and, and follow that procedure. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? And, uh, yeah. it's, I'm sorry, just a follow up. Uh, so, I mean, the complex, the more the complex the network is, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, more difficult to basically modify it, but uh, uh, if you want to basically work on like modifying the network, for example, VGG16, add more layers and, and adopt it to your problems, uh, 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 do can you recommend to some of uh, uh, the examples where yeah. we can follow it? Yeah. Exactly, that's today's uh, later. Maybe in the Slack, maybe you can uh, refer to basically modifying uh, the the underlying neural network itself. See, that's, that's precisely transfer learning, and that uh, happens to be precisely what I put in here as, an, as a template in the notebook I give you today. So it has a first part of the means. I don't know if you can see it. Um, Rick, can, yes, can you see? see. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And then, uh, because I didn't want to just uh, keep talking about means, and I know that many of you are actually interested in using CNN to for particle physics, I thought at least I'll give you an example. This is this LAC Olympics. I share with you just a few images, a few hundreds of images of these jets with signal and background. And then what we do here is precisely, let me just show you. So signal and background are just uh, 
essentially the images that, as you can see, are quite sparse because um, the energy deposition is very localized. And um, we then use a CNN learner, so it's transfer learning, where the initial model that I use here is ResNet 34, but you could put VGG 16 or whatever you want, and then you train on it. Uh, okay, let me show you this since you, uh, you asked for, for this. This model is super long, right? It has lots of stuff, typical, right? But the idea is that you don't have to retrain all this. You freeze most of these layers. What's going on? With my, aha. Uh -huh. You freeze most of these layers, keep them as they are, so you don't have to retrain them, and you just train the last ones. And um, then you can train all this uh, signal and background problem, uh, images of, of events, and then you can distinguish between these two and export your model and stuff like this. This is just a template of something you could do, and you can actually run, run in this notebook, but you can adapt something similar to your program, where, uh, sorry, where now your inputs will be some type of images, and do the transformations you think are liquid for data augmentation of your images. And then you call your model to transfer, and instead of ResNet, as I told you, it's good if you try different ones. And um, here you can change whether it has been pre-trained, you can change what layer to freeze, and so on. And you can actually specialize to your particular problem, and you can try many of those, and it's pretty fast. It, it quite, uh, it's quite fast, I would say. So yeah, if you follow the notebook link today, you probably can find some of the stuff you were asking for. And if not, just contact me and I can help you with this problem. Okay, okay. thank you. Welcome. Any more questions? Okay, not, I'll see you at 12.30. And have a good morning.